It's now my pleasure to introduce Laboratory Director Paul Kearns. Paul has been Argonne's director since 2017. He set the laboratory's strategic vision to deliver pivotal discoveries, pioneering leadership, and powerful scientific tools and facilities. Now here's Director Kearns. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Linda. It's good to see uh, those of you that have joined us, but also welcome those that are online. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, the Director's Special Colloquium on the Electron Ion Collider. It's uh, something that we've uh, been in process on for, uh, I guess, about two years, interrupted a bit by the pandemic in terms of timing, but we're really glad to have today's uh, guest speaker in uh, conversation around the Electron Ion Collider. Um, if you're here in person, I, I do hope that you've had the opportunity to, uh, to grab a coffee or a cup of tea and maybe a donut uh, beforehand, uh, really uh, have conversation with your colleagues from across the laboratory. Um, now that you're properly fuel fueled, hopefully we'll have a really lively dialogue uh, once we get to the Q&A. So. Uh, Brookhaven's National Laboratory's uh, Electron Ion Collider will open uh, new frontiers for fundamental discoveries in nuclear physics. The EIC is a one-of-a-kind uh, physics uh, research facility. It is quickly moving through the early phases of the Office of Science project management uh, 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 process. We're really excited to be a part of it. I have the distinct pleasure of being a member of the uh, EIC Laboratory Directors uh, Council along with colleagues from across the U.S., but also national laboratories from across the world basically participating in uh, the Electron Ion Collider project. And so I get a regular update. It's quite exciting. Uh, they've got a good infusion of money from the Infrastructure Reduction, uh, I'm sorry, no, not Inflation Reduction Act, and uh, really has given them a head start in terms of the project. And they made great progress. Uh, much earlier progress than I, I think originally anticipated due to that infusion of funding. Uh, so really fantastic to see. Um, uh, once it's completed, uh, the project uh, will provide a window into understanding the matter that makes up our world and by extension ourselves. Through its experimental endeavors, the EIC will, as we say, unravel the mysteries of the universe. That's why the science community is working together to develop the technology for the Electron Ion Collider, and Argon is playing really a part, uh, really, uh, in this effort. It's one of the Department of Energy's top priorities, uh, certainly in nuclear physics and more broadly across the Office of Science. Uh, we're taking a key role in the collaboration itself, uh, known as EPIC, the Electron, uh, Electron Proton Ion Collider Collaboration. EPIC. Uh, it is a collection of hundreds of scientists and engineers uh, formed at Brookhaven, really, and across the community to design, build, and operate the very first e EIC experiment. Um, the Argonne EIC team includes scientists uh, from our physics division, high energy physics division, and material science division. They are leading the design and construction for the barrel imaging uh, calorimeter for the EPIC detector. Uh, they will deliver on the stringent performance requirements uh, set by the EIC scientific community. Uh, we also have folks from the uh, Photon Sciences uh, Directorate engaged as well. The EIC community has adopted uh, many software and computing tools for the EPIC detector simulation and optimization, uh, developed uh, with the support of our uh, LDRD funding here at Argonne, so we're pleased to see that happen. Our EIC team, our EIC team is high, highly active within the EPIC collaboration. In fact, we just hosted its January 2024 meeting really successfully, I believe. We also provided some 700 magnets from the old APS storage ring, which we replaced as part of the APS upgrade. It's great to see the mag magnets being repurposed and really put to new use and having a second life, if you will, in terms of the, their scientific contributions. For these reasons, we certainly look forward to learning more about the cutting edge capability of the new facility. Plus, we are always eager to increase collaborations between Argonne and Brookhaven National Laboratory. And uh, today's colloquium can certainly spur, uh, spur both events. To bring us the latest news and her perspective, we have uh, Haiyan Gao, Associate Laboratory Director for Nuclear and Particle Physics at uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory. She's been in the role since 2021. Hi, Anne's uh, Crafts Brookhaven emerging expertise at the future 
uh, electron ion collider. She is leading the exploration of profound questions about uh, nuclons and how they form the nucle nuclei of atoms. Hyen is a former Argonne colleague. It was really great to have her return to the laboratory, uh, acknowledging her past time here, serving as an assistant physicist, physicist in 1996 and 1997. She was also an assistant uh, and associate professor of physics at uh, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She received her PhD at the California Institute of Technology and was also a postdoc at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. More recently, Hyann was a professor of physics at Duke University, and so we're really pleased to have uh, her here today. Uh, before we hear from Hyann, I want to express my gratitude really to all that had a hand in really making today's colloquium happen. Uh, our colleagues from across the laboratory, uh, really uh, thanks to the uh, director's colloquium committee and, and also singling out Linda Young and Ian Cloat for really their, their fantastic work, along with the communications team and the public affairs effort uh, that really made today's uh, 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 colloquium possible. Now let's welcome uh, back Hyen Gao, please. Paul, thank you so much for the uh, Linda and Paul. Um, thank you very much for the nice introduction and Anne and many others for having me here. Um, it is really a great pleasure for me um, to be here. Um, as Paul mentioned, my first um, job, a uh, first real job actually was at Argonne. I was a system physicist from 97 to 90, sorry, 96 to 97. And also talking about the future uh, electron ion collider, which is a frontier facility for nuclear physics at Argonne also itself is a great honor. This laboratory has a glorious uh, history um, accomplishment uh, in nuclear uh, physics. And um, it is always a good idea to remind us, you know, what is nuclear physics about? And uh, especially for um, uh, early career uh, colleagues in the audience. Uh, as you know, nuclear physics is not a new field, right? So sometimes people wonder a little bit why we are still, you know, uh, working. And, and the reason is actually quite simple. If you think about um, um, the, the, the energy and um, the mass, the visible part, let me talk about the visible part first around us in the universe. And they mostly are come from atomic nuclei, and they come from nuclear reactions. And we also know that in nature, there are four fundamental forces. And if you think about atomic nuclei, and they participate, and um, you know all four fundamental forces, strong force, which is pretty obvious, electromagnetic force, not difficult to think, and neutron decay, beta decay, uh, nuclear beta decays, weak force is a very important part. And of course, gravity, even though it is so small compared with the other forces, but we know it's there even in atomic nuclei. So this is actually a very fascinating field. Um, and although you know we are only a small part of the whole universe, like you know less than five percent, but understanding this part of the structure, which is um, visible matter. Um, also has an extremely important uh, 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 impact on our understanding of the nature. And our standard model has been quite successful in terms of unifying uh, electromagnetic, weak, and strong force. But we also know that um, within the standard model, um, strong force, and this is the area we really um, have a lot to learn, right? And the theory is very beautiful. This is the quantum chromodynamics. And um, we always like to say you can use that to put it on your mug. You can make a T-shirt uh, out of the QC Lagrangian. But this theory is also fascinating in the sense that it has very interesting feature. On one hand, we know the confinement. We, you know, other than um, at uh, relativistic heavy ion collision, whether it's at RIC or the Large Hadron Collider, we can free the quark, right? We can create so-called uh, minute band uh, quark ground plasma, but they are actually, uh, you know, um, are confined. And then when you go to the high energy side, um, and life is a little bit easier in the sense that the strong coupling constant 
the interaction becomes weaker so that we can do perturbative calculations, we can calculate, then we can do experiment with accelerator at high energy, and the theory, this particular feature has been well uh, tested by experiment, but on the other hand, you know, we do not live in the high energy, right? So in, we are kind of stuck a little bit in the confinement region, which is the so-called non-perturbative region. So therefore, understanding QCD really requires us, it's a very interesting and also intimate um, uh, 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 integration or collaboration between theory, between experiment, between instrumentation, between uh, with calculations and computing. And so um, our goal is really try to understand um, the structure of the matter, right? We start with nucleon, and then we want to ultimately, our goal is really try to understand everything about um, atomic uh, nuclei uh, in terms of their structure, their reactions from um, the first principle of the theory, which is QCD. And um, so electron ion collider, uh, before I talk about that, so let me just tell you, um, when you think about the nucleon uh, structure itself, it is extremely rich. So the picture here, the animation, is just to show you the quantum fluctuation of the QCD vacuum, and based on the lattice QCD uh, calculation. And the static photo here on top, uh, this is something, um, it's a, another beautiful collaboration between physicists and artists right, to present how the atomic nuclei look like. So it really depends on what kind of probe size you are using. I just had a very nice tour of the APS looking at the X-ray facility. So here we're talking about, um, you know, it's a microscope, except, you know, the, the lens scale we're looking at is 10 to minus 15 meter and, uh, and much, much smaller than, than that. So if you actually, you know, are using a little bit longer wavelengths, probe to look at the proton, you will see mostly like three happy quarks, right? And But if you adjust your resolution, you see much more complicated kind of um, uh, landscape. And then the more you go to the smaller wavelengths, you will see a very complicated many body relativistic uh, system. And um, so a very powerful probe is to use so-called lepton scattering, which is we use electromagnetic interaction and to look deep inside the nucleon and also atomic nuclei. And by doing uh, uh, lepton scattering, for example, I can do, uh, we can do electron scattering. We can vary the probe size, right? So if I use a probe which is on the order of one Fermi, I should be able to see the, you know, the size of the, the nucleon. And if it's much smaller, then um, we are able to probe to see the platonic structure like the quark uh, inside the, the nucleon. And this is in fact um, what people have done for decades, um, doing electron scattering to look at the, uh, um, the, 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 the proton uh, electromagnetic structure to look at their excitation and then go all the way to discover um, they are point-like particles inside the, the proton. And similarly, people do electron scattering to look at the atomic nuclei structure, their excitation, and the platonic structure inside the, the nucleus as well. And what is inside proton neutron? It is not something you know people just realize in recent decades. This has been going on for a long time. If you go back all the way to Otto Stone's work, and in fact, you know, the discovery of anomalous magnetic moment of the proton itself is already, uh, it, it already told us that the proton has an uh, internal structure. And uh, so several Nobel Prizes given in terms of, you know, looking at the electromagnetic structure like the size of the, uh, um, the charge radius, which is the uh, uh, charge distribution weighted size of the uh, proton. And later, people did um, deep elastic scattering. They discovered the platonic or quark structure, right? And we already talk about the asymptotic uh, freedom. Um, and so in US, currently, there are two major Office of Science user facility which allow us to probe the internal structure of the um, uh, proton and also atomic nuclei. One is the Jefferson Lab. Uh, facility CBAF. Many scientists here are very much 
uh, 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 engaged and leading um, some of the uh, exciting experiment there. And there is also a relativistic heavy ion collider at BNL. And in the future, there will be the electron ion collider. So these are the, uh, the existing and also future facility. And speaking about electron ion collider, um, this has been in the making for many years. And I remember when I was a graduate student, I already uh, started to hear. And the first uh, EIC workshop happened you know, um, in the 1990s. So as you all know that nuclear physics do a very good job with long range planning so that um, the electron ion collider was discussed in a lot of detail in the 2017, sorry, 2007 long range plan and highlighted in the 2015 long range plan. And Zanidi Miziani and many other colleagues played a very important role in uh, preparing the, uh, uh, the, the science case for the uh, EIC. And um, so EIC was um, uh, highlighted uh, as one of the recommendations in the 2015 long range plan and later National Science uh, Academy of Science Engineering and Medicine carried out assessment study and uh, the most latest development, as you all know, was last year's um, Long Range Plan, 2017. So in the, 27, sorry, in the 2023 Long Range Plan, and the recommendation is the expeditious uh, completion of the EIC as the highest priority for facility construction. And, and the science of the EIC, we wanted to uh, really answer the question about the mass and the spin uh, 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 contribution. Where does the proton get the spin and the mass? And we wanted to take an uh, image of the uh, internal exciting landscape of the, of the uh, uh, nuclei and, and atomic nuclei. And we also wanted to explore a new uh, frontier in the sense that we go to a gluon rich region and to ask the question about the gluon uh, uh, saturation. And of course, we can study um, hadron formation and um, many other uh, interesting uh, physics. And um, so this is a, um, a, a, a international collaboration with very, very strong uh, US um, national lab um, uh, contribution. And um, Paul already mentioned argon has been playing a very important role, and the role will become even more important. Fermi Lab and uh, Berkeley Lab, and also Oak Ridge and Slack, are all contributing um, to um, EIC, and we have many international uh, uh, collaborators and partners. So currently, um, we are waiting for the CD3A uh, approval, and the meeting, uh, ESAP meeting, has been scheduled for later uh, this month. And um, the EPIC uh, detector design is very advanced, and uh, we are working very, very hard towards the uh, CD23 uh, timeline. And another very important development is the EIC Resource Review Board. And this board was established about a year ago. And we already had two meetings. And the next one will be in May in, uh, in Rome. And here I, uh, I stole two slides from Maria. She, um, uh, Maria uh, Zurich gave uh, uh, the first science talk at the first um, uh, EIC RRB meeting. And she did such a wonderful job so that this time we are going to um, uh, have another science talk at the uh, um, RRB meeting in Rome. So this picture, just to show you very quickly that the very powerful approach EIC will allow us to do is to do the so-called deep inelastic scattering. We can vary the probe size. And of course, a very important aspect is the polarized beam, polarized electron, and polarized proton. And we also have a plan to have a polarized uh, helium-3 beam, which is like a polarized neutron. So this will allow us to look at the internal detail, particularly in the region which is um, corresponding to um, anti-quark and the gluon-rich uh, region. And this is the region, as you can see in this picture, uh, we uh, really need uh, the data. So here, show you, um, I hope I can. I hope I can do this. So here, <laughs> this is. So here, show you uh, what uh, EIC will be able to do, um, both in terms of the uh, the kind of probe resolution. We are going to have a, a very 
a smaller and smaller probe, and also the Kanamaka region, which is um, uh, unique in the sense current facilities um, with polarization capability are not able to reach the Gruan uh, uh, region, uh, anti-quark uh, region. So this is uh, important. So now I want to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the physics. And um, so the first question has to do with the proton spin. And again, this is not uh, 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 completely um, new in the sense that uh, late 1980s, so we are 2020. So it has been going on for quite some time. And um, so what, what this shows us is that, you know, if you look at the history of physics, and when you have a new instrumentation, new development, new type of measurement, you learn new things. Okay, completely new. You never done before, like polarized deep elastic scattering experiment. And another way for us to discover new thing is when we do something so well, so precise, right? And that also uh, often lead to new discovery. So in this case, um, this original experiment, uh, European muon collaboration experiment and they did a polarized uh, muon scatter from polarized proton. And then um, what they discover is that, um, you know, quark, quarks have spin one half. So naively, before the experiment, people, you remember I talk about, depends how you look at the proton, right? So the kind of picture we are very comfortable, it just three quarks inside. So naively, people think the quark should contribute most of the protons being one half. So when they did the experiment, they were very, very shocked because with the experimental large uncertainty and also the finding, it looks like quarks spin do not contribute much, right? So this was a shock. And um, people say that's called proton spin crisis. But I think that we physicists also are to, uh, uh, to be blamed for in the sense that we you know, think a little bit too naively. The picture is more complicated, right? In addition to the quarks, we also have gruons. And gruons have uh, spin. They are spin one particles. And then there are also orbital angular motion, right? So, but what is very good is that this kind of um, data you know, really triggered major effort internationally um, and major efforts theoretically, okay? So there is a very nice uh, review article. Uh, Jung is uh, part of the uh, uh, author uh, published a few years ago in Nature Physics, did a very nice review. So here is a slide I think I borrowed um, a while ago from Zenity uh, who did a nice job. But the key messages is to show you that in the last 30 plus years, it's like every facility people have experiment related to the proton spin, um, let me just call spin a uh, puzzle. And so we made a lot of progress. So since I am from BNL, so I would like to um, tell you a little bit about the spin program at uh, BNL. And RIC is a very uh, unique facility. And we are very proud in the sense that that is the only facility which allow you to recreate the early universe like one microsecond after the Big Bang to free quark and gruons to you know, study, discover QGP, which we did, and QGP behaves like a perfect fruit in nature. And, but at the same time, this facility also allow us to collide polarized proton with polarized proton, both polarization longitudinally, which is along the proton momentum, or transverse. And um, so one very important contribution of RIC spin, uh, program, uh, spin program is the fact that our experiment shows that gruons spin contribute to the proton spin. And before that, we did not have um, very, um, I would say, um, you know, um, solid uh, experimental evidence suggesting that because of uh, indirect way try to get the information of the gruon spin contribution was difficult. And the RIC spin program was the one established that although experimental uncertainty uh, was due uh, relatively large, 
but uh, with the global analysis and the picture is pretty clear that ground spin contribution is quite significant. And uh, more recent data shows that we have improved on the experimental measurement uh, very well. So this is uh, one uh, major accomplishment. And very recently, last year, um, Phoenix Collaboration published um, their direct photon uh, result. This is um, PP collision with polarization, but they also measure direct photon cross-section as well as double spin-dependent asymmetry with longitudinally polarized proton on proton. And the significance of this result is that not only we show that gluon spin contribute to the proton spin, and they also lined up in the same direction as the proton spin. So if proton spin polarized this way, and gluon spin uh, contribution is along the same direction. So this is a, a very important uh, result. Okay, so after so many um, uh, experiment worldwide, I think the picture now is clear is especially in the quark helicity contribution, so many experiments have done and the uh, information is a lot more precise. Um, it's about 30% of the proton spin come from the uh, quark spin. And for the gluon, um, you know, could be just as significant as the quark, maybe even larger. And, um, and um, so a very important uh, piece of the puzzle, which is still missing, is the orbital angular uh, momentum contribution to the proton spin. And I want to highlight lattice QCD played a very important role in uh, recent years in predicting um, the, uh, um, the, 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 contribution of um, uh, quarks and uh, gluons and their orbital angular momentum. So let's take a look at with the EIC um, how well we will you know, improve the knowledge um, about the gluon spin contribution to the proton spin. And this picture here, the, the 2D um, uh, a contour plot show you that currently our knowledge is the the blue contour, which is big, big is not good, right? Not very precise, but with EIC, uh, different center of mass energy uh, of different beam uh, collision configuration, and we can actually achieve something like the yellow uh, contour shows, which means that the knowledge will be improved uh, uh, significantly. So now I want to talk a little bit about um, the kind of three-dimensional tomography uh, we would like to take. Right. So at APS, people take, you know, a lot of images of different kind of system, whether it's biological system or uh, material. And here we're talking about, you know, um, nucleon. And I know that Ian's work has also a lot to do with and both theory and experiment. Also, this kind of three-dimensional tomography of atomic nuclei. And, and this is what we are going to do, um, both currently at Jefferson Lab in Jefferson Lab um, energy region and in the future at the electron uh, ion collider, with the electron ion collider. And there are two different ways we can look at um, the three-dimensional structure of the uh, uh, nucleon. And one is to look at, you know, their three dimension in momentum, right? So you're really thinking about the, the motion of the uh, partons, you know, quarks and gluons in three-dimensional space, but we're looking at their three-dimensional momentum Okay, in this, this kind of picture we would like to take. And just naively, if you think about um, orbital angular momentum, I really need to know, right, all three uh, 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 dimensions, uh, the momentum, the motion in all three dimensions. Another very interesting way to look at the three-dimensional structure is that it's a hybrid kind of three dimensions. So one is along the momentum direction, right, if I give the you know, parent proton a kick in this direction. I call Z, I call longitudinal, that's the direction. I can look at a quark, for example, carry a fraction of the momentum of the proton in this direction. But then the other direction, I look at the transverse coordinate space. I look at this kind of hybrid. So in this case, one we call transverse momentum dependent parton distribution. In the other case, we call generalized parton distribution. A very uh, uh, interesting uh, development theoretically is that one can use so-called five-dimensional Wigner distribution to connect these two different ways of looking at the three-dimensional uh, 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 structure um, in a coherent way. 
how much time I still have? OK, OK. OK, so since I'm still good, the, your lab director tells me it's still good, so I will continue. So, um, so not good? OK. So, uh, so, so we are looking, let me talk a little bit about confined motion first. And um, I'm sorry this table may be a little bit complicated, but um, do not be discouraged. I will try my best to make it simple. And um, so nothing is free, right? When I now want to look at three dimension, no structure, so that the price I will pay is I will learn more, but I also have to look at more things in order to learn more, right? So that's why in this case, we have more, you know, um, this kind of uh, functions or structure function we need to look. And um, so the kind of experiment we can do is that, you know, we have, if I have a proton, I have a beam, electron beam, I can polarize electron beam longitudinally. I can also just do unpolarized electron scattering. And for, for my target, I can have an unpolarized target, which is always easy. I can also have a polarized target. When it's polarized, I can polarize in the same way as the momentum direction we call longitudinal. I can polarize transverse. Okay, so I can do different kind of combinations. And so the black arrow indicate the nucleon spin direction. If it's U, means unpolarized. L means longitudinally polarized. T means transversely. Polarize. And similarly for quark, I do the same. I use the same notation, and um, I use color red for quark. I will not go over all these, but let me just pick three examples out of the eight. So, so one uh, TMD we call transversity TMD. So in this case, uh, we are looking at the following situation is that the target is polarized this way, okay? And I'm asking the question, you know, what is the probability for quark, anti-quark to polarize along this way as well, right? So that is what I'm trying to look. And, um, but the, the momentum direction I'm looking at, it is due along the uh, Z direction, okay? So this is the kind of physical picture. Now, if there is no relativistic effect, no relativity, so if that's the case, when the target is polarized this way, and the momentum is also this way, okay, and I'm looking at the spin-dependent, um, um, you know, effect of the quark, quark polarization along the same direction at the, as the uh, proton, if there's no relativity, it shouldn't matter when the target is polarized this way, I'm just asking now, what about the quark also polarized this way? They should be the same. If there's no relativity, I need to worry about. Fortunately and also unfortunately that um, inside the nucleon, it is a highly relativistic effect. So therefore, these two are different. So the difference also tells me relativistic effect inside the uh, proton. I mean, I don't know how you feel about this, but to me, that's actually very exciting and also fascinating, right? So that's why we wanted to study this. And, and this quantity has another interesting saying when you measure this quantity and in the end, you actually can determine another quantity called tensor charge. You may be wondering, why do I care about tensor charge? Well, in some way, maybe, but the interesting thing is that, you know, we do care about charge. We do care about the mass of the proton, the mass of the quark, right? The mass of the uh, um, uh, proton. But tensor charge, actually, fundamentally speaking, it is just like mass, just like charge. And people on the lattice can calculate that very, very precisely. And this quantity also connects to some of the uh, weak interaction relevant quantities, such as uh, beta decay and also electric dipole moment. So that's why this quantity is extremely interesting in the sense that um, it allows us to directly confront precise prediction from the lattice, right? So, and also allow us to um, um, connect to um, standard model test and new physics. And in the interest of time, let me just uh, talk one more example, which is so-called Sievers. And Sievers' is, uh, function is nice and interesting. 
So in this sense, if you remember the graphic uh, representation I talked about early, is that I'm really asking to look at quarks are unpolarized, but the, the parent, the nu nucleon is polarized. Okay, now just naively, if you think about angular momentum conservation, so somehow orbital angular momentum should come uh, into play, otherwise I have a problem. So this quantity in many models show you that if there is no orbital angular momentum, I should not see this function, it should be zero. Uh, in another words, this also allow me to probe orbital angular momentum contribution uh, to the proton spin, and which is something we talked about early, quite interesting. And this is a program also worldwide because you can use different facilities and because it's actually, I'm trying to make it simple, but in reality, nothing is simple. So you really need to look at all the process in the end. We want to be able to have a coherent way of understanding of this kind of three-dimensional structure. So it really takes a village in order to understand. Now, if you think, um, sorry, and so let me just use one example, which is some inclusive uh, deep elastic uh, scattering. We talked about deep elastic scattering before. And some inclusive deep elastic scattering is that in addition to detect a scattered lepton, I also follow a leading hadron coming out and I do a coincidence measurement. So this will allow me to really um, you know, probe the kind of three-dimensional motion of the, uh, of the quarks. Okay, so in the interest of time, so let me just um, move on. If you think about TMD is complicated enough, welcome to the world of generalized pattern distribution. And this is actually extremely exciting, I can tell you. And, but this is also um, uh, quite complicated. I see smile on my colleague's face. I assume that you agree with me, right? And, um, but the nice thing about um, this kind of physics is that the process itself is very clean. Okay, so you have a well-defined initial state. We always need to do that because we know what we're doing, so we know our initial state. But the final state is also well-defined. It's called exclusive process. So you have a well-defined final state. So that is really the beauty of this physics. Um, but the complication is that there are a, a lot of things you define in the middle, but you cannot directly uh, 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 probe that. So therefore, this is a, a very interesting, but also very intimate uh, uh, project collaboration between theory and experiment. And let me uh, make the story short. So I want to tell you a little bit about deep Compton, deeply virtual Compton scattering. So in this case, we have an electron beam coming in, electron beams get out, a virtual photon is being exchanged. So that's the virtual part. So you have one virtual photon. And then my target is proton. And then my final state is still proton, but I have a real photon coming out in the final state. So this is called deeply, ver uh, or deeply means that I also need to meet um, the kinematic requirements. So it's really looking at the quark inside, so the kind of deep uh, region, right? And um, so, of course, if you think about QED itself, I can have final state with a real photon and proton, but not necessarily through this kind of picture, right? Because I can have initial state radiation from the electron, I can have a, a photon radiation from the final state electron, right? So this is so-called beta Heitler process. But in this case, you actually can utilize beta Heitler process to use the interference to help you to um, uh, extract information. And people can also do unpolarized measurement and different kind of pol polarized measurement. And you do the combination in order to um, extract information. And um, by the way, this is the uh, kind of case there, there has been major effort um, in order you know, to use um, a lot of computational uh, tool and algorithm to help you and machine learning and AI can play an important part. Okay, so this picture um, is really to uh, show you with the uh, um, EIC, um, deeply virtual Compton scattering, and also deeply virtual meson production are going to be studied. And with the uh, vector meson production such as JSI, 
that allow us to look at this kind of three-dimensional structure of the gluon, right? Jefferson Lab will really allow us to look at the three-dimensional structure of the quark. And with EIC, we will look at the anti-quark and also the gluon. So here, just show you some of the, uh, the kind of information uh, one will be able to get from the EIC. And um, I, I did mention to you in terms of um, I did mention to you in terms of transversity T, TMD, and, and we can use that to determine the tensor charge, and the tensor charge connects to our standard model test as well. But let me just show you, um, when you do experiment with proton and also neutron, for example, at Jefferson Lab, we can do that with polarized uh, helium-3, and at EIC, you can use polarized helium-3 beam as well as a a proxy to neutron, to polarized neutron. And that will allow us to separate the tensor charge of a U quark and D quark. And here show you the kind of improvement uh, one can achieve uh, when you do the EIC measurement as well as solid. Many of my colleagues here at Argon are very uh, um, important um, part of the solid effort at Jefferson Lab. So you can really see how much uh, improvement the smaller count will show you, you know, what is the kind of um, uh, precision one can achieve uh, in the end when you combine uh, EIC with uh, solid. Okay, so, um, so here is a picture just to show you that if you combine the tensor charge determination and the next generation of electrodipole moment search from the proton and the neutron, you can actually determine, you can put the constraint on the quark EDM um, very significantly improvement. And that allow you, uh, in the study we have looked at, when you think about the sensitivity to new physics uh, in terms of energy scale with solid, we already can achieve 30 to 40 TeV. Of course, that is a model dependent kind of finding. And with EIC, you know, this will only improve. And, and the reason this is possible is that, um, so the tensor charge uh, matrix element, which give you the tensor charge, and which is just the coefficient in front of the uh, um, nucleon EDM when you write them in terms of the quark EDM. So that's how they are connected. Okay, so, um, so there are a lot of interest um, from in uh, recent years, uh, which is, I think it's a very fascinating development. We talk about deeply virtual Compton scattering in order to look at the generalized pattern distribution, which is three-dimensional structure. But this kind of work also allow us, allow physicists to look at the pressure of the quark experienced inside a proton, okay? And um, I personally still have a little bit, um, um, you know, issue try really to understand uh, with a uh, deeply virtual Compton scattering experiment to connect to the so-called gravitational foam factor. I can think about how do I do a foam factor measurement uh, involving a gluon, uh, sorry, involving a graviton, um, you know, in my head. But that kind of Duncan experiment is impossible. But uh, my colleagues were able to explain to me that the very naive way to think about is you have two photons involved, and um, and um, so that actually can give you the kind of uh, way to access graviton, which is a spin two object. But the key insight uh, they have observed, again, keep that in mind, it is a model dependent uh, insight, is that the quark pressure, the pressure feels by the quark inside the proton is like 10 times of the pressure at the center of the neutron star. And to me, that is actually a very fascinating uh, finding. And of course, you can also look at the shear uh, stress um, as well. And uh, this kind of work can be extended um, to the future uh, electron ion collider um, by looking at deeply virtual Compton scattering experiment um, as well as um, other related. But this work will need um, you know, close collaboration with the uh, theory community. And um, so I think that I probably can only say a few words about the uh, proton mass. Uh, in the interest of time, but you have so many 
expert, uh, Zanidi and Sylvester and many others, colleagues here who really have pushed uh, shape. I, I think you guys have done a great job shaping the importance of this physics. So here the question is, um, what about the proton mass? And at the risk of uh, making uh, some of the high energy friends a little bit uneasy, maybe unhappy, is that the Higgs, Higgs discovery is wonderful, it's great. But when we think about the proton mass, uh, they actually almost became irrelevant. And, and the reason is because proton is not a fundamental particle, right? It is, that is really the reason. And um, gruon plays such an important part of the proton mass. And there are different ways how you can look at you know, the proton mass uh, composition, and people have also done that on the lattice as well. But I think the most important thing is really to understand the gluon uh, uh, contribution to the proton um, mass, and particularly, you know, there, there is this so-called um, trace anomaly piece, and some people also, Shang Dongji, like to call that is the quantum anomalous energy. I think that just sounds much better, right? Quantum anomalous energy, and this is something we really need to uh, study. And um, so the way people are looking at experimentally and theoretically um, uh, quite extensively is really by looking at um, you know, heavy um, um, uh, quaconium production. Uh, I mean, sorry, JSI is not so heavy, but it's, you know, it's heavy enough compared with U quark, D quark, and strange quark. And, um, and also upsilon uh, production at the EIC. And very exciting recent work um, Zenidi and colleagues have done, it published in Nature last year, is so JSI production near the threshold, right? So really the dominant mechanism, although more work is in order to firmly establish the production mechanism, but the two grew on contribution is very important. And that is the kind of connection, if you think about connection to the gravitational form factor, right, through the two gluon kind of picture, and that allows the collaboration to look at the, uh, the, the graviton uh, form factor. I'm, I meant to say the graviton form factor, and also to look at the matter radius of the uh, proton. And which is, uh, when you think about, um, and, and, and nucleon, radius itself is a fascinating subject, right? We talk about early on the charge radius, and Zenity and colleagues look at the matter radius at RIC. My colleagues use a relativistic heavy ion collision using the electromagnetic field carried by the heavy ions, and they were able to probe the gronic radius of the other heavy ion. So one electromagnetic field from one heavy ion and probe the grounds in the other field, in the other heavy uh, 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 ion, and by determining, and they determined the strong interaction radius. So that is another fascinating thing. At the end of the day, we will need to do very precise JSI measurement and very precise um, um, upsilon measurement at the EIC, and that will allow us to um, really uh, have um, we will be able to make a major advancement in understanding uh, where the proton uh, mass contributions are from. Okay, so um, let me just um, skip because I, when I uh, was a system professor at MIT and I always had a dream um, before my lecture, which is that I was talking in my lecture and two thirds of my lecture, I ran out of things to say. So ever since that dream, I always over-prepared. And I think over-prepared is better than under-prepared. So I will skip um, the, uh, um, there is a very important physics with nuclei, and I'm sorry, but you, you have a lot, you know, contribute a lot to this, but this is an important uh, subject, but in the interest of time, I will just, um, be very, very brief, just saying that the most important question here we wanted to address is the gluon saturation. We want to discover, and we have evidence uh, both from RIC and also LHC, looks like gluons are saturated. But I think with the EIC, this will be, um, if this is really the case, this will put everything on firm 
ground and also to establish uh, or to investigate the universality of ground saturation, which means whether we see uh, the saturation in light nuclei and heavy nuclei in very similar uh, uh, fashion or not. Okay, so um, let me say one word. So electron ion collider is a discovery machine and that will allow us to address some of these very fundamental questions we just briefly talk about. And I think this machine also provides enormous opportunity for innovations, as Paul already mentioned, whether it's detector or magnets or, or, or computing or data acquisition analysis, but also extremely importantly is the workforce development. And I think that we have so many labs um, you know, in actively uh, are part of EIC, and this will also allow us to connect to universities, and especially those non-R1 university minority serving uh, institutions, for example. And I already mentioned this, and I want to say that um, it is um, EIC, it is, uh, uh, we have two host labs, Jefferson Lab and also BNL, and the machine will be built on the site of BNL, but we have this partnership and this partnership with uh, GLAB, you know, it has been integrated in the project uh, uh, management as well as scope. And we have so many um, uh, national lab and universities are very much involved in the uh, 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 construction, in the science and in the detector. And um, so after a uh, about a year long uh, process, you know, um, the uh, Detector Selection Committee complete its recommendation and the community worked very hard and formed EPIC uh, collaboration. Argon is a very important part and the EPIC collaboration is very active and the January uh, uh, meeting was extremely successful and this is um, general purpose uh, detector and um, the detector is um, on very good track to meet the CD2-3 uh, timeline and argon is playing a very important role in the um, barrel parameter. And um, this is a major international collaboration and it's a state of the art um, a collider detector. And um, so this is a, another picture of this interaction region. I already mentioned about RRB and we had two very successful RRB and the next one will be in Rome uh, in May. And um, so a very important part of the RRB is to help um, and also secure international in-kind contribution and in both in detectors and in accelerators. And we are making very, very good progress on the international um, in-kind contribution. So here is the project uh, schedule. Um, as we know today, or as we you know have today, but that also depends on the overall funding uh, situation. And the major milestone, as I mentioned, CD3B review, very successful last uh, November, and CD3A uh, milestone will achieve um, at the end of this month. And currently, we are planning for CD2, uh, CD2 to be uh, in alignment uh, with the RIC uh, timeline. Um, and um, this is the uh, project funding profile V4. And I check with my colleague, Jim Yak, who is the director of EIC. And he said that you can still show this one, but next week, you know, we will have a different version. And uh, so that depends a lot. We know FY24, uh, about 98 million, which is very good. And Paul mentioned about IRA funding, which is also a major boost. And we recently just finally, we got the 100 million from New York State. They committed to give us the money, but it took quite some time to get the money. So um, the green bar shows the New York State money, so that's all very good. And um, so this is the timeline based on the, this particular funding profile, and that you know is very much uh, funding uh, dependent. But our goal is to complete the RIC science mission, and then our skilled workforce will be transitioned to the EIC uh, construction and currently, we already, just to give you an example, our collider department uh, uh, workforce and um, accelerator experimental support workforce, about 50% already are part of the EIC effort. So it is, it is not a trivial 
excise, um, you know, and to how to do the transition very smoothly. And um, some of you may not know, we also built a new collider detector throughout the pandemic that is called S Phoenix. And we brought S Phoenix online last, sorry, yes, last May. And unfortunately, we had a major technical event, so we had to end the run on six weeks early. And so that, of course, um, you know, add additional uh, stress to the already pretty stressful kind of situation in terms of the overall timeline. And we need to finish the S Phoenix uh, science goal. And not just S Phoenix, Star Detector also completed forward upgrade. And the Star Physics goal is very much uh, synergistic with EIC. It uses a different kind of process and that allow you to test the universality of QCD for some of the important physics EIC uh, uh, is uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, addressing. So that's why it is extremely important for us to complete and then we move on you know, to the EIC uh, construction. So the final slides just shows that RIC and then EIC and that is, should be very simple, just RIC to EIC. Um, it will take a lot of effort and, and thank you all very much for your, Paul, you and your team, you know, for your uh, engagement, contribution and, you know, working on this uh, enterprise together. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> really fantastic. <laughs> that was really appreciated. And really, the conversation and your preparation was obvious. So congratulations in that regard. Really fantastic. Uh, very evident that I have a lot to learn about nuclear physics. <laughs> and really fascinating, uh, really, to uh, imagine the work that's already been completed, the science that's already been completed at uh, RIC, as well as what we might do with the electron ion collider. Certainly. Uh, well, let's turn to some questions. I, I think. Uh, let me do a signal check. Are we still using poll everywhere? Is that the plan? So actually, people in the room can go to the mic stands that are on either side of the front of the room, which we encourage. And then I will be monitoring online questions. So if we run out of questions in room, I'll chime in with some we're getting online. OK, thank you very much, Bethany. Linda, please. Hi, Anne. That was a fabulous talk. And, and I could connect a little bit to the part where you were talking about tests of the standard model by measuring the tensor charge in these nucleon. And the reason that I could connect a little bit with that was because I was just listening to this fabulous colloquium by Dave DeMille, where he wants to do tabletop physics, uh, tabletop high energy physics, right? And so what I was wondering about is, could you sort of compare the, you know, the, the, um, the precision of the tests of the standard model that you would get you know, with this versus the, the tabletop? I, I think that, you know, um, tabletop and this. So when it comes to standard model tests, right, and colleagues in high energy physics can attest that somehow new physics seem to be so evasive and, um, and you really need to do all these. And I think that, um, you know, the tabletop atomic, for example, some of the atomic experiment people do um, on tabletop and some of the, you know, people in, you know, and they actually, the beauty is that they are looking at the same new physics, the same kind of very high energy scale, but using a very different experimental approach, right? Mm -hmm. And um, there is a um, limit in some way if you think about, you know, when you want to, let's just say the new physics really live at 100 TeV, right? So at some point, you know, you kind of like what kind of accelerator we're going to build and are we able to do it in a cost-effective way? I mean, it's not, that, it's not that trivial, just keep going to higher and higher energy. So that's why you do need. But to answer your question, I think that all these needs to be done because at the end of the day, you want to be able to explain everything we do, whether it's a tabletop or whether I do parity violating electron scattering or I measure transversity TMD, I determine tensor charge, you know, I compare, for example, you, we need to do everything, mm -hmm. right? 
And in fact, right. another um, fascinating topic uh, you will resonate perhaps more uh, with AMO is that proton charge radius, right? This is another great example. We do electron scattering and people do atomic spectroscopy measurement, whether it's uh, ordinary hydrogen or muonic hydrogen, right? And, and then in the end, you know, we can ask the question that people also are connect to with the muon G minus two when it comes to new physics. Yeah. 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 So I could, yeah. Okay, one one other question. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to hog the questions, but I do have a question. Um, you know, you're making these uh, very exquisite polarized beams of electrons and, and ions. Can you explain a little bit about what are the particular challenges to to technical challenges uh, going there? Yeah. Uh, I think that um, polarized electron beam, you know, um, obviously doing that in the storage ring is, you know, a little bit different from Jefferson Lab and, and Slack and other places, but I feel um, actually a lot very good about, you know, polarized electron beam for EIC and polarized proton beam, you know, we do PP collision. So not only we know how to polarize proton, we know, you know, two proton beams collide. I think that certainly there are also some, you know, technical things, but overall, I don't think there are major uh, issues. And now, Polize Helium-3, this has been an ongoing effort, and we are actually, even as we speak, we are using the upcoming Rick round to do some of the Polize Helium-3 beam-related EIC work. And, and I know that eventually we will also like to have a Polize Deuteron beam. And that is so far, you know, is a little bit far in the future. Okay, so no, ma no major showstoppers. You're, you're all, all... No major showstopper show for EP, and I, I'm also hopeful for e helium 3. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ian, for um, yeah, really showing us the beauty of what we're trying to discover with nuclear physics. Um, so this, this, this last slide is um, really interesting. So I'm, I'm curious, of course, there's a, another facility, uh, so that's Jefferson Lab. And we, that Jefferson Lab has a user community of around 2,000 people. And Rick also has a similar size user community. And these communities have to come together to deliver the science of the EIC. And uh, this is going to be a really interesting uh, thing to observe and participate in. So I'm curious if you know how you see that uh, panning out, and and the challenges you see, and the opportunities you might see as, as you know, the QCD communities come together um, to to deliver the science of the EIC. Yeah, I think that that's a very very good question, and certainly scientists are driven by the science, right? So they go to the best place to do their most exciting science they want to do. And um, so in terms of the, uh, uh, currently the RIC community is about a thousand users, which is um, smaller than used to be. And the reason is a lot of people are doing heavy ion physics at LHC as well. And you and I both in the long range plan, so we know uh, that. And, um, and you, you know that the EIC science is very compelling, so that's why we're building it. At the same time, I think it has enormous uh, potential, and you also know that a community is very interested in a second detector, right? And the second detector, I personally think that it is extremely important, you know, to, um, to think about the, the uh, certainly, you know, major discovery needs to be validated, needs to be confirmed, that is no doubt. But I also think the second detector is a great opportunity for us to think about you know, some of the physics. I mean, one thing I learned, right, people sometimes wonder, you know, you are a Jefferson Lab person, why you are actually at RIC, right? But one thing I learned is really the beauty of physics, right? In the end, you realize that, you know, that's a very interesting way you actually can use heavy iron to do this, right? So my point is that we actually are making a major effort to, um, to, um, to develop um, the kind of physics uh, we learn from heavy ion collision and that we can do maybe better or maybe differently with EIC and developing. So that I believe will attract, you know, 
uh, more heavy iron colleagues um, to okay. be part of the EIC effort. We already have good fraction. We need more, obviously, yeah. Thanks. Uh, uh, one more question. So I think the EIC is, you know, one of the biggest science projects for the foreseeable future in the United States. And I'm curious if you see much synergy or opportunities, you know, for the EIC connecting with other parts of the Office of Science. Yeah, I think that, you know, we were talking at breakfast. In fact, we just had a retreat um, at BNL a couple of days ago. And uh, January, I actually co-hosted a workshop with Stony Brook and um, HEP, uh, DOE HEP also organized. So they all center around accelerator science, technology, and workforce. So the P5 report, I keep looking at Rick. <laughs> uh, the P5 report, you know, has, uh, I think it has the kind of hope for US particle physics community in terms of, we all have to live much longer, right, than the current um, um, science and uh, medicine allow us. But I think that there is a roadmap, right, going into the future, which is um, uh, particularly maybe muon collider. So I think the point is EIC will be the only collider this country is built in the next 20 years at least. Okay, that's not an overstatement. And, and I think this is a great opportunity for the community to come together, right? And that also is an investment in the long-term future. Because even if government say, we give you the money, but if you don't have the people, you will not be able to build. And I think that is, and of course, scientifically, there is also great synergy. And in fact, one of the things we are talking about, that's the other thing I learned. I, I can share what I learned, because for someone from Jefferson Lab, you know, but Collider is very different because the magic, you know, in terms of taking data, they all seem to happen at the end, right? So at Jefferson Lab, JLab Program Advisory Committee will always say, I can cut your beam time by a, fa by a factor too. You should still be able to get reasonable sign, but not with Collider. So my point is that the luminosity will keep getting better and better. And then some of the electroweak physics uh, will do very well. And this is the other area, I think, that when you think about the synergy. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Ian. I am. Thank you for that very nice talk. You make me very nostalgic for what I was doing a few years ago. But um, yeah, so I just wanted to make a comment that, that to echo your what you just said. So there are very strong synergies, both in science and in accelerators with high energy physics. There's a lot of things that, although the, the, you know, the focus is different, obviously we're trying to all understand what is happening with the universe. and. And this will actually give us a lot of, lot of things that we need in order to actually explore the, what we call the energy frontier. Right? So, so I think it's very important that, that energy physics work closely with, with uh, nuclear physics. The other thing that yeah, I, is this accelerator thing. There is actually right now a drive towards different kinds of accelerator, both for BES, for nuclear physics, and in high energy physics and into a far, far future, and how we actually manage this with the workforce we have, and how we manage the workforce that are for the people who are funded between different offices is actually a very important question that we need to sort out in the next few years. Yeah, and related also material science itself. I mean, there are enormous synergy when you think about the future on a way of building accelerators. You know, that's also another area. I think I should pass a question. I don't know when we will have nuclear physics director special colloquium. <laughs> so um, I remember, I, I think I disconnected a little bit, but I remember when the discussion was about uh, funding S Phoenix 10 years ago. And there was a lot of discussions about E Phoenix and the value of really uh, starting a new detector while you know, we are trying to shut down uh, RIC to get EIC. So now you will take data with S Phoenix. I'm sure it's valuable. Do you see when you talk about second detector that this will be some E Phoenix kind of thing? So you don't get the community excited about designing a, a new detector and then we'll have the competition? Uh, very, very good question. As, as you know, that um, the, uh, um, the actually, uh, when we ran the, when Jefferson Lab BNL, we 
organize the detector selecting selection process. And one group of scientists, their proposal is ETCHI detector, which is based on as Phoenix, right? And in the end, you know, the, the, the committee also recommended the approach, which is more in alignment with ETCHI in the end. You know, the final product is EPIC. And um, so EPIC will, at least the plan currently, will reuse uh, the outer parameter blocks. And indeed, our colleagues are very, you know, interested in thinking uh, about, you know, what can we do with S Phoenix, remaining of S Phoenix. But I think at the end of the day, um, again, I think that science should drive in the end, and not just I have a detector, so therefore I want to make my science fit. I, I, you know, we should think about the science first, and then of course we want it to be responsible when it comes to funding, right? What makes most sense? Yeah. We, uh, step in and ask Bethany anything online? Uh, they were actually covered already with some of your answers, so okay. I think we're good. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, let's give uh, a, young, a, a round of applause again. Thank you very much, really, for the great conversation, uh, really eye-opening conversation about the great potential of the electron-ion collider and the, really the important contribution that Argon is making to the overall effort. So thank you very much. Really appreciate you being here. And, and uh, again, uh, congratulations, really, on the great science. Thank you. Thank you all for joining.